Well, here I am at Port Arthur, walking up a track lined with lovely oak trees. Beautiful big old oak trees. Thought I would start up this end where there are a bunch of buildings. All the tour people have gone that way. So what have we got here? Obviously a church. Kind of looks like a castle. Ah, churches. They always find the most well positioned land, don't you think? What we just walked through then was Government Cottage. Hmm. These are the gardens, of course. The Government Cottage and Church Gardens. I imagine a lot of croquet played on those lawns. Well to do elite picnics, probably served by convicts, of course. I may or may not make up a little bit of my own history as I go along. Kind of like Quentin Tarantino, just rewrite a bit of history for the hell of it. Forest behind government house and the church. A wise convict might want to disappear into there. <clears throat> Let's go back through the church. Can you imagine the stained glass that would have been in here? Ah, oh, they just don't build things like they used to. Hmm. I wonder if I could pick the apple trees. That's 
probably stealing. We'll probably get sent to Van Diemen's land for that. Old Boothie looks like a hard ass. We now present the first episode of Dan and Dave. A human story of two typical Australians. Their families, their lives, their hopes, their doubts, their fears and their triumphs. The characters of Dan and Dave represent all that is sturdy, honest and resourceful in the great Australian outback. You'll laugh with them, you will sympathize with them, and perhaps their troubles may in some way remind you of your own, and perhaps their courage will inspire you. Now let us visit the homestead, now let us enter the homestead. It is night time, and in the living room we make the acquaintance of Dan and Dave. Dan is sitting at the table, laboriously writing, while Dave has just finished reading. What are you doing, man? Uh, I'm very busy. It's a deep long hole. Why don't you do something useful instead of sitting with your nose in the paper all night? Oh, I finished the paper now. Quite modern. I'm not really sure if I'm supposed to be going this way. But I'm in a new building now. And it looks closed. This building was... Uh, the accountant's house. This is well before blockchain technology. This ledger keeper could easily fudge the books. Moving on. All right, what's this little building all about? What I do love about old construction is stone slab flooring, although these are all bricks. 
I love stone flooring. Real stone. I'm not sure what this little building is. Almost looks stably, like stables. Look at that beautiful big pine tree. I know it doesn't have a lot to do with the convict history, although this tree could be as old as that. It's just a beautiful pine tree. I'm loving the long wheelbase golf carts. If I have one of those in my future, make it a panel van or a wagon. Just going to take a breather here on a park bench. Snack on an apple I just took from the post office apple tree in the front yard. Someone's got to eat them. There's a whole orchard down there. My goodness. Cold and delicious, I think. Mm. So we're about to enter Charlotte Lempreur's house. Who had 12 children and was known as a wonderful pianist who probably entertained many people. <clears throat> Grand Timber Archway entrance. Ah, oh, Charlotte's sitting room. And there's her piano. Well, she probably entertained many a guest with her vast repertoire of the classics and her writing desk for when she would write back home to divulge the conditions of the colonies. Over here we have the grand dining room where Charlotte entertained many dignitaries and noble guests. Apparently she only had one servant and she was quite active in the freedom movement for convicts and women and helped very much with uh, pregnant women. So for a woman who had 12 children and only one servant, she obviously did a lot of work herself. Possibly a guest bedroom, I would say. Or obviously family members, 12 kids. There's probably eight of them in this room. That looks like their little privy. Maybe, could be wrong. Here's a bedpan, fill that with coals and put it in your bed, kind of like the old fashioned hot water bottle. I believe this would be Charlotte's room where she probably still had to share her bed with her, not only her husband, probably a couple of the two youngest. A beautiful old timber table desk. What have we got out the back? courtyard where the children would spend hours with their hacky sacks and leather balls up against the uh, stone wall. Well, it looks like a dining hall of some kind. <clears throat> a 
love this timber walkway, covered walkway here. Beautiful. Moving on. house for a cow. Rations were strictly monitored not only for the convicts but for everyone living and working at Port Arthur. However, some of the more senior staff often had luxuries that others were not permitted. The dairy and government farm did not commence operation until 1859. Prior to that, people such as medical officers, as the medical officer were able to keep a dairy cow of their own. In 1857, a plan of the outbuildings in this courtyard shows that this space was designated cow house. The healthy quality of cow's milk was noted by many of the settlement's doctors and prescribed in the daily diet of hospital patients and invalids. And here is the cow house. Yes, many a metal cow was brought over on the ships from England to service the colonists. Although the milk did leave a bit of a metallic aftertaste. Look at this beautiful stone slab floor. I love stone slab flooring. Can you imagine if I found a property old enough that had a structure on it that had stone slab flooring? Ooh, that'd be wonderful. Poison? Must be big rats in here. Hey, little birdie, you stuck. You want to go out that way. Let's see if we can get you out. Here you go. Go down. Go down, little fella. I've made a gap for you. Come on, down you go. Look, I've made a gap for you. Come on. Come on. Come on. I've made a gap for you. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Let's go. There you go, little fella. Let's not have this convict window slam down on me. The irony is not lost on me, I just freed a bird. That bird is free from Port Arthur. Ooh. Very dungeon-esque down here. Hello, stink. <clears throat> some kind. <laughs> okay, we're about to get into some serious business now, the penitentiary and the asylum and separate prison. This is an example of what we can expect of the asylum. Probably just a creative soul who was misunderstood 
Port Arthur elk. A Sri Lankan elk imported by the Tasmanian Acclimatisation Society. The elk had been taken to Slopen Island off the Tasman Peninsula, but it escaped and swam across the channel to the coal mines. There it is there in the distance. I don't know if you can see it. But it's a metal elk. So that was a good job swimming across the channel to the coal mines. They imported a lot of metal animals. Mainly because of the sturdy construction of these animals that they could do the hard work of the colonies. <clears throat> I know I'm just getting stupid now, but Soldiers Memorial Avenue. A beautiful style of pine tree here, the perpetual remembrance. Originally transported to New South Wales in 1837, John Quigley received a life sentence in 1843 for having firearms in his possession. After time at Port Arthur, Port Arthur and Norfolk Island, Quigley was charged with armed robbery and attempted murder and subsequently declared a dangerous lunatic. He was again sent to Port Arthur where he was imprisoned in a pad padded cell in a separate prison and given a special exercise yard covered over to prevent his escape. This became known as Quigley's Cage. I believe that's what this structure here was. This round structure just outside of the penitentiary walls. Life sentence for having firearms in his possession. Hmm. It's almost applicable to current times. Nobby the horse, in the early days of Port Arthur, the heavy task of delivering water throughout the settlement was carried out by convicts. However, when the settlement was near enclosure, most of the remaining convicts, convicts were old or infirm. So other methods of getting the heavy work done had to be found. Nobby was a workhorse that lived in Port Arthur during the 1870s. He was most likely housed in the stables, a government farm. At night and during the day he worked hard pulling a cart and delivering water to the civil officers' homes. We know of Nobby as he died in the line of duty and the commandment reported his death to the colonial secretary. And there is Nobby. A hardy steel horse. Common theme for animals brought to the colonies. They needed to be hardy. On a steel horse I ride. Someone's nice little abode. was a convict basketball ring.
One hour of a day exercise. That's a sturdy lock. Ah, glorious sunshine for an hour. Looks like a courthouse. She was heard to have uttered that I must dance. every single one of them. Whippersnappers. Just a bunch of likely lads. That's breakfast and supper. Not a lot of difference. Pretty sure I've got one of those spoons. The fashion of the day. That compass will take you where you want to go. <clears throat> okay, the hospital.
place. Hospital overlooking the asylum. Hospital high on hill. Smith O'Brien's cottage. My apartments are cheerful and airy. Their position is elevated and healthy. I have been supplied with a bookcase and covered in four tables, a washing stand, four chairs, and with very hard seats, being such as we are used in kitchens in Ireland. views little room in there don't know if you can see it <clears throat> and it's locked What is that, a harp? Lovely cottage though. Nice bushy backyard. Nice little veranda. And a view over all of the settlement. prison right at the harbour pretty much off the boat and straight in okay the military barracks Ooh, a Dutch door. I do love a Dutch door.
Now it's time to look at the main prison. Obviously all these individual stone areas, wall in between each of those foundations. These are all cell blocks obviously. Same there. And two or three levels of it. exercise yard ablutions area Final look at the main prison and that was the hospital up there behind it which you wouldn't have seen back in the day unless I went further back the harbour any fish there we go look at those fish we'll have to zoom in See if I can get close to them without them scattering away. There they go. And that is it for me. Hopefully you can zoom in on that and watch that seagull dive in and pick up that fish. Nice little jetty here, little dock. So here's my guy, the card I was given, to find out a little bit more about this person. I guess it represents me in a way. Let's find out. Daniel Nightingale, aged 27, native of Darlaston, Staffordshire, England, 
His trade was a screw forger and blacksmith labourer. Well, we're tradesmen, we've got that in common. And I have taken a little bit of time off work every now and then, but that's because I'm self-employed. I can do whatever I want, but I've never been a slave to the man. So yeah, there we go. This pretty much concludes my time at Port Harbour, at Port Arthur. Well, that's Port Arthur done and dusted. I'm just uh, warming up the car. Getting ready to head up the east coast now. Coles Bay Conservation Area, basically, Freysen A. So that's where I'm headed. Heading up the coast now to find a free camp up to the Freysen A Peninsula.